You're listening to KWOU. Coming up next, the amazing, unbelievable adventures of Dr. Theophilus Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion Archibald, the Tasmanian Emu. For more information, please visit your loved ones before they wordlessly fade away into cold, gray emotion stuck to the underside of your mind like chewing gum in a concrete locker room. You know the drill. It's boring. But the whole thing is mine. Thus, I'll dig deeper or just resign. Dr. Henry Hughes, how are you? I'm very well, Jasper. Thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, so first of all, what are your pronouns? What are your nouns? And what are your adjectives? My pronouns are he, him, but I also like she and her. I don't, well. I don't you know, I like all pronouns. Um, my favorite noun, did you ask? Yeah, what what, an, what, is your, what are your nouns? It's an unusual question. I guess fish would be a noun that I like. I like, I like fish. Hmm. And uh, what are your adjectives? Um, rural. Rural. Yeah, rural. I love rural. I, li- I like the word rural. I like the way it sounds, rural. Yeah, no, you know, double R's and very, very uncommon. A lot of mud in there, you know, and, and kind of composty. Doesn't it sound like, like leaf mulch, you know, rural. Absolutely. Uh, give a brief description of who you are, what you do, and the cool things you have done, just for some context for the sake of the listener who doesn't know how important you are. <laughs> uh, I am uh, Henry Hughes, <laughs> and he was born on Long Island, New York. Wow. And uh, yeah, and then I went to South Dakota on a football scholarship. Hmm. People looking at me now have trouble believing that, so it's nice to be able to say that with you, Jasper, on radio. Wow. Um, so I went to, I did my undergraduate in South Dakota at a little little college, and I loved it. I loved the prairies. I loved the freedom. You know, I had a you know, small college experience, kind of like Western, had some great teachers. Then went on to grad school at Purdue in Indiana doing creative writing and uh, loved creative writing. And then I went to Japan and China for five years. I lived in East Asia, had an awesome time. Writing, teaching, exploring, fishing, uh, living out all my nouns and adjectives. <laughs> uh, and then went back to Purdue and did a PhD in American literature. So I have the creative writing and the literature. I took this job in 2002. I've been here 20 years at Western, living in Monmouth, and I love it. Wow. I mean, that's, that's quite the journey. <laughs> yeah. So you've waxed poetic quite extensively on rivers. Could I ask you to do the same here? Uh, well, I love rivers, but I like all bodies of water. So I grew up on Long Island Sound on the Atlantic, and uh, I was really drawn to the salt and the currents and the tides. But, you know, living in the northern plains, it was the Missouri River, and Indiana had the wonderful Wabash, and then, of course, the great rivers of Asia. Now I'm close to the Willamette and the Columbia so rivers, you know, they're an obvious source of life. They're, they're like veins through our body, as Langston Hughes said. And uh, I connect with them on so many levels. I love their movement. I love their life source. And I love fishing, mm. boating and fishing. So getting on a river, uh, taking my boat down a river, catching some trout or some bass. And yes, I have written a lot on rivers. In fact, I have a collection, an edited collection coming out very soon called River Poems. Uh, it's uh, Penguin Random House will be doing it. And I've gathered river poems from around the world and, and from, uh, by contemporary poets. And I uh, enjoy teaching river poems. You know, you were in the rivers class, and we had a great time talking about rivers. So, you know, as you know, from the praise of the Nile, right, in ancient Egypt until the modern day, rivers have always inspired people in so many ways. Mm. Is the sound of a bell tolling made any less beautiful by the knowledge that the sound is artificial? If the answer is no, why worry about authenticity at all? Uh, Great question. I would say the answer is no. Um, And we talked about artificiality, if I recall, because the carolins here at Western, those lovely chimes that we hear, are generated mechanically. There is no one ringing a bell. Mm. And I know it's a hotly debated subject here on campus, but I think it's just another, you know, kind of expression of art. I mean, it's all kinds of, you know, synthesis, right? I mean, a synthesizer. Um, I mean, our very voices, Jasper, will be carried, right, Mm. uh, over the airwaves and will be heard maybe uh, years from now, maybe through very different devices. But it's still us. We are still humans speaking here in this moment, 
And so, you know, I mean, I think it's the experience too. If someone says, oh, that's a human being talking, or if someone says, that's a lovely sound, it's noon, you know, that's good. That's enough authenticity for me. Huh. In my radio show's story, the character Luce is a fisher, though he's quick to differentiate between fishers and catchers. Is Luce just being pretentious, or is there a palpable difference? It's an often talked about difference. You know, it's it's funny if you if you're out fishing and someone isn't catching. You know, I'll say, "How's it going? How's the fishing?" And they'll say, "Oh, the fishing's fine, but there's not much catching." You know, <laughs> so people do. You know, maybe as, in, as a as a joke, you know, kind of differentiate. I would say there is a there is a persistent sense that the art of angling is about the process, is about just getting out there, getting out in nature. Like take a fly angler, for example. Um, he or she may have a beautiful cane rod and hand-tied flies, and, and they understand the water. They're just having a beautiful experience. If they catch a fish, it's a bonus. Now, on the other hand, I like catching. I'm, I'm also honest about what we're out here for. And so I can be, you know, kind of driven to, to actually you know, bring home the fish or at least catch and release the fish. So I go back and forth on that. But I understand that people do love the process rather than the product in, in sport fishing. Hmm. Would you rather write a country's music or a country's laws? And what kind would you write? Oh, definitely a country's music. I, I have no um, experience um, with the law, either keeping it or writing it hmm. um, or abiding by it. Um, <laughs> so music to me would be a much better uh, <laughs> way of legislating uh, happiness and experience. So yeah, no, I'm definitely one of the people who I enjoy maybe contributing in some small way to the music, the narrative of this moment in time in America, in the world. Hmm. In terms of law and politics, uh, I I do actually abide usually, but I'm more of a spectator. Sure. Hmm. We haven't seen the moon since it left crying three days ago. Where do you think it went and what did we do to make it weep? Okay, well, I'm a big fan of the um, musical Dr. Doolittle. You may have seen the original 20th Century Fox with Rex Harrison. I believe so, yes. And there's an early song about the moon um, that, you know, certainly the moon is, is eaten by some large creature every month and then is kind of rebaked like a pie and reappears. And so I subscribe to that particular explanation uh. to the moon now the crying part complicates things you've personified it in an interesting way may i be so bold as to turn the question back to you uh, can you can you talk about this um well i'm not very good uh with emotions not even my own let alone other people's so i would almost be quick to to put whatever made the the moon cry out of my mind and say, you know, it's probably just gone off to process. And um, if it's ready for to be in a relationship with the earth again, maybe it'll come back. Well, that sounds very sensitive and understanding. I think you're, you're in touch with your emotions, at least in terms of sympathy and kindness. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I hope the moon's okay. Yeah, I, I hope they are as well. Why are we, uh, as humans, obsessed with Zen? Why don't I just go out and get what I want? Well, I mean, Zen doesn't preclude the idea of going out and getting what you want, but I think it suggests, again, like your question about angling, that there are certain processes or certain ways, good ways, uh, wholesome and complete ways of achieving things. Mm. It's not pragmatic. The ends don't justify the means. Um, we actually have to do something in, in the right way, in a good way. And I, I like that idea. Mm. You know, that if you want, you know, if you want something, you don't just go and steal it, although that's an option. You know, you, you work toward it, you cultivate, you know, you shape. Um, I like that. So Zen appeals to me in the sense that it puts emphasis on process, on, on art and grace and motions that are constructive and, and mindful, that we think about what we're doing. We don't just like strike out crazily and just do it, although that has its place too. Hmm. As a, as a tangent, when, when does striking out crazily have its place? <laughs> I feared you would ask that. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't, you know, discount the need for just impulsiveness. Hmm. 
you know, and just sometimes we have to, I mean, it, it can be dangerous. It can be, and it can be violent. And I don't advocate that, but sometimes we can overthink things or maybe over nuance and finesse things. There's something to say just for, I don't know, coming home and, you know, slamming a shot of whiskey or, you know, you know, crudely um, picking a tomato off the vine and shoving it into your mouth, you know. Hmm. I, those are maybe some safe examples of, of an impetuosity. I like that, impetuosity. How long have you been writing? Um, well, as Catherine Schmidt would say, I've been writing since um, kindergarten. <laughs> uh, but how long have I been creatively writing? Yeah, definitely grade school. I liked writing stories and poems. I was always into that kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah, I loved my uh, my parents. You know, read to me. My mother and my aunt read to me quite a bit. So I had a lot of stories in my head. And then, of course, there was television, which I loved as a kid too. We only had you know thirteen channels, hmm. but um, but so I always liked I liked stories on TV and radio, and I tried to emulate them, and create stories of my of my own and poems. That's cool. What does inspiration feel like to you? Um, what does it feel like? I like the way you phrase that. Um, well, it feels good. I mean, to have an idea and to want to do something with it feels very good. Um, I feel I'm a morning writer, always have been. So I like to get up early when I'm in the zone, when I'm behaving myself and not like staying up late and partying, mm. but I'm just kind of doing, you know, getting to bed early and exercising, <laughs> seriously eating right. I really believe in that, mm. you know, that, um, kind of being ready to do the work. So get up early and I'm, I walk to school every morning. It's about a 10 minute walk. And I think about what I want to write. And I love that time. Sometimes it's dark, sometimes it's light, but it's early. The, the neighborhood is quiet. I can hear birds. And I, I feel like an idea. Maybe I'm working on something I have been for a few days or weeks, or maybe it's brand new. I'm going to start a new story. I'm going to start an article. I'm going to write a poem. And it's, I get kind of, you know, juiced up. <laughs> Yeah. Do you feel this way when you're going to write something? Uh, perhaps, you know, it's uh, sometimes more scheduled than I would like it to be, just sort of fitting it into a time slot. But it does. Yeah, it feels like uh, anticipation for action. Beautifully said. It is anticipation. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I agree with you also about the time slots. Heck, you're a student. You know, you've got certain things due. And yeah. I also do writing for magazines on assignment and I have things due. And they, you know, so that, that does kind of <laughs> take a little bit of the romance out of it, sure. you know, but, um, I still feel like you say the anticipation, the excitement of, of starting and writing. Hmm. Why do we call nature beautiful? I have no idea. <laughs> no, you, we do have an idea, don't we? I was just thinking about that this morning. How nature is inherently beautiful and it's not a, a work of art that we shaped. It's not a painting or a magnificent work of architecture or sculpture. So it must be just like deeply coded in our DNA that that's our world and it's natural. And it must also suggest like fecundity, like that's, we can eat this, you know, it can keep us warm. It can, it can sustain, it's, it's life sustaining. I, I really, it's a great question, Jasper. And it must be something deep in our animal natures that says this is good now again we can see a beautiful city street in manhattan and say this is also beautiful that's that's different but there's something about a forest an ocean right a desert it doesn't matter there's something like people like this is beautiful so what why do i mean i i don't know you want to take a shot at that too uh, i i i don't like to the, to contemplate those things without um uh, a good bit of time since I do happen to sort of argue against myself for about a page and a half. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I understand that too. Yeah. Sure, sure. I don't know. So I feel like as I'm maturing, the why uh, seems to be more detrimental to me than beneficial. Hmm. Um, I'd rather just stick to the is. <laughs> so nature is beautiful. Is, yeah. is almost more profound to me than why is nature beautiful? Well, that's a scientific approach, right? Scientists want to know how, hmm. but they don't really, I mean, why? That's kind of a philosophical question, right? Indeed. But um, I think, you know, if you're going to write, and I know you write well and think you're going to have to try to weave the science and the philosophy and at least endeavor to try the why. I mean, I, I don't know what I'm doing when I, when I answer the why either, but... 
what the heck, right? True. Give it a shot. <laughs> All right. Which direction tastes the best? Um, north. North. Good to know. What is something that you do to relax that isn't actually very relaxing? Well, you know, that's interesting. Exercise. I mean, it's it can be rigorous and it's you can sweat and feel tired and even kind of push yourself. But soon after, you're very relaxed. That's an amazing sensation after a workout that you, you know, they talk about endorphins and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever is happening chemically. Damn, it feels good. So I, I appreciate that. And even fishing, you know, it can be intense certain situations if i'm fishing let's say uh, an inlet with current and other boats i'm trying to troll for salmon and managing the gear it's kind of you know wild but it feels good like Mm. like maybe it's the the right after you know maybe it's connected to your question about the bells and artificiality and authenticity i don't know i'm seeing some interesting connections but relaxation sometimes is a result of of an activity, not the activity itself. Ah, I see. I like that. What is the natural progression of technological advancement and why does it include robot assisted goat therapy? Um, you know, I have to say, I don't know, but I'm very interested in robot assisted goat therapy because I really care about goats. I think they're important animals, yeah. both culturally. We think of the Bible, of course, the Middle East, the Chinese love their goats. And I think that they need, we need to reach out to goats more than we have. Hmm. What is your perception of the internet? Um, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, navigate it like the mariners of old. <laughs> I sail about and land on wondrous islands and pick fruit. Uh, but sometimes I get attacked and, you know, uh, my ship takes on water. You know, it's crazy. Who knows? It's just, it's space. I'm out there driving around. But I worry that, you know, it can also be distracting and it can mislead. That's my main. All right. I know I sound like an old curmudgeon, but it can mislead people who don't have a good basic education Mm -hmm. to just go out there and have someone presumed to be an expert and tell you something about the government or your body or literature. Right. We've we've joked about there are some lousy uh, interpretations of of great books out there. And. Mm. So I think, you know, we all could use like a, a moderator or, an, I don't know, an assistant, a co-pilot. Sure. Um, I don't know. Do you feel the internet is kind of nutty and wild? Absolutely. I, I almost think necessarily so. Okay. Yeah. So we got to be careful, but we got to sail nonetheless. We got to get out there. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Which is better? Uh, this is a related question, I suppose. Which is better, reality, hyper-reality, or surreality? Um... How would you define hyperreality? Hyperreality is when the artificial becomes higher than the natural. I mean, certainly that has its place in the sense that we love art. Mm. We're circling back on this question of artificiality. It's interesting. I mean, I like things that are constructed and made. I mean, that's what writing is all about. And when someone writes a story, they create a whole new universe, right? A novel is amazing. I don't know if that's hyper reality, but it's it's certainly different than what just happens in someone's life and the facts of someone's life. So I guess I like it. I like it all. Hmm. Um, is a generalist. I, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's an interesting question, and I, I, I like you. Maybe I need some time to think about it. Hmm. But I'm definitely I don't privilege. You know, I mean, I love nature and I love what's re- what we call real. I live in that world every day. So do you, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm also enjoy living in other worlds. I like watching films and getting lost. Don't most people? Mm. I can appreciate a good fantasy. I can appreciate, you know, just the the magic world of music and and art. So I hope maybe it's like the internet. You know, you got to sail around. And be careful. Alrighty, good to know. As I've stated before, uh, I can easily get bored when certain subjects in art are always depicted the same way. As useful as they are, my brain is not satisfied with tropes, archetypes, or truisms. I want to believe that art can do anything. Can it? Should it? And why does it not? Well, I think it does. (laughs) Doesn't it? I mean, it seems to do almost anything. Um, I mean, film would be a good example. I mean, you can have all kinds of films, right? From very surreal 
bizarre, you know, just kind of experimental things to very realistic portrayals of a historical moment and scenes from our lives. I think art can do a lot. Maybe we don't, maybe it can't do everything because we don't, we haven't pushed it there yet. Mm. But um, I mean, I like the fact that art, for example, in painting can be very representational. It can show us people and forms and, and colors and, and, and you know, designs that we recognize, but it can also be abstract, right? And just represent inner states of being. Think of a Mark Rothko, you know, just those, those, those squares of color or Jackson mm. Pollock throwing paint on the canvas. I think, I mean, so that's an example of the range of just something as, as simple and maybe limited as, you know, paint and a canvas. I mean, it's not even digital or it doesn't, you know, have the magic of the internet or Pixar or something, mm. but it's still, wow, it can cover a lot of territory. It seems to me both psychic states and so-called real states of the world we live in every day. Hmm. What makes you angry? Um, what makes me angry? These stuffed animals are starting to upset me a little bit. <laughs> I just think they haven't been well cared for. I think this one needs a shampoo. Mm. So neglect, neglect makes me angry. Um, when I see a dog that's chained out in the rain mm. and he's cold, that, that can make me angry or a cat that's been kicked. So, um, I'm sure that makes a lot of people angry. Neglect. That's my answer. Okay. Okay. What's a figure of speech that doesn't exist yet, but accurately describes a sliver of life? <laughs> That's the craziest question I've ever been asked in my life. So <laughs> an expression that doesn't exist, it can't be an expression if it doesn't exist yet, can it? Sure it can. Give me an example. Um, gosh, that really just, um, uh, that's the whale's blowhole, you know? That Now it exists. Now it exists. So there you go. Yeah. And it means just like, um, you know, something that really makes you spurt out your insides. I think so. that was really brilliant. Yeah. Hey, you know, speaking of whales, can I read a poem? Uh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So I lived in Japan, as I mentioned, for a couple, for three years. And when I got there and, um, in 1990, people were still eating whale. Like you could buy it in the supermarket. I was fascinated by this. Wow. Because um, although I'm in favor of, of preserving whales, I believe in conservation of, of large uh, cetaceans. Um, I, you know, said, what the heck? So I gave it a shot. And so, you know, it's kind of like risking your own integrity for experience. I think that's something you're interested in as well. Very much so. And so when you mentioned the whale's blowhole, you know, I thought about um, this poem that I wrote uh, when I was in Japan. It's called Eating Whale. Whale, there, right in the supermarket. So I make a soup. To taste crime is to believe in yourself. I close my eyes like God, thinking feet gone to flukes. My fabulous tail, seagrass, turtles, steely blue fish, all this, and the fatty sound between my teeth crackling like a billion bubbles. So it wasn't really that delicious. It was, and the texture was very fatty. But you hmm. know, I wanted to try whale. Huh. That's a very sort of uh, evocative poem. Yeah, I mean, the the visceral experience was was interesting for me, as well as the kind of you know, as a Westerner and as an American, kind of transgressing, you know, and eating like a, a dolphin. They you know, there was they eat a lot of dolphins hmm. in Japan. I think that is diminishing. I haven't been there in years, but. Um, it's just a kind of a curious cultural difference. Huh. What's the best way to remove a sliver of life from your foot? Uh, I'd like to use tweezers, but I also make sure you put alcohol in the area to try to disinfect it. And then just keep your eye on it, you know, so it doesn't get infected. That's my advice. Very well. Uh, what's a favorite author of yours? I, you know, I like a lot of writers. Um, you know, I mentioned The Whale. I mean, when I was in college and graduate school, I fell in love with Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick. Very well. And I know it's, oh my goodness, you know, one of the great books. But I really loved it. That really spoke to me. You know, there was something big and deep and powerful in that voice. And, and Melville asked some of the really, the really, you know, significant questions about, the kind of questions you asked, Jasper, you know, why are we here? Who are we? You know, is there a God? You know, what does nature mean? You know, what's the role of art? You know, what is America doing? 
Um, those questions are all in Moby Dick, you know. I mean, we're, we fight our oil wars, and they were out there, you know, slaying whales for their oil, you know, to light their, their worlds. Huh. And, uh, so that's one author from the 19th century in my education that I really love. Interesting. What is the proper relationship between fiction and reality? What is the difference? Well, proper, you know, that sounds a bit judicious. I don't know if I, anything proper, but there isn't a relationship. And I mean, I, uh, I mean, if you treat it artistically, I think it's a healthy relationship, maybe even a healthy uh, balance because you live in a world and, you know, I, I like people that are decent and kind and don't hurt others, you know, generally speaking, uh, who show up to work, you know, uh, like my students to come to class and, and be prepared, right? But, you know, I mean, the fictional world, anything goes. And, you know, so we can create and uh, even fall in love with really bad people. Uh, we've had this discussion in class, you know, should we like should we like characters? If you recall, we had a class, right? Precisely. Where a student was um, was kind of couldn't identify or, or didn't like uh, a character because of their behavior, the things they did or didn't do. Well, I think that's good, too. I think we need to have that world. And when it's fictional, we can visit it. We can explore it without any harm done. I mean, in a fictional world, you can have people, you know, uh, shoot others and maybe explore the ramifications of that. I don't want to see that in the real world. Mm. You know, I don't. I don't want people killed. So I, but you know, of course, it's going to happen. So I guess what I'm saying is, the fictional world allows catharsis, exploration, allows us to travel through time, travel through different personalities. We love write fiction about criminals. Um, we love you know fiction about heroes too. So I, I like that world. But you know, reality has a has a role, and we can't lose touch that real people and real lives matter. You know. So I don't know. What do you is that? How does, how does that sound? I'm not, I'm not looking for anything. <laughs> okay, you're not. You're always looking. We have to be looking for something. Hmm. Well, m maybe I'm looking for nothing, and that's the something I'm looking for. Okay, I know you like existentialism and nihilism. So, oh, you're, you're interested in those philosophical yeah. ideas. So, I am. So that would suggest, uh, yeah. Okay, the open hand is the empty hand. Precisely. Okay. What do fish dream about? If you were to dream you were a fish, what fish would you be? And how how would you be sure you weren't a fish dreaming you were a man? Um, there's a wonderful story by Akinari, maybe you're alluding to it, called The Dream Carp, which, which I anthologized in one of my collections. A uh, great Japanese story and about a monk, you know, who uh, who just kind of, he's such a great painter and he, he falls in He loves fish. He loves fish and he becomes a carp. Um, I think I'd like to become like a salmon. Mm. I'd like to dream salmon dreams and um, go out to sea, you know, and just see what it was like out in the ocean. It would be terrifying. I mean, orcas would be chasing me and sea lions and great white sharks. And then, of course, all the commercial nets and everything else. Mm. But um, that journey, you know, I'd like to dream salmon thoughts. And then what does it feel like to know you have to go back, to go back to your natal stream? I mean, that, that's so that's a dream I'd like to inhabit and then come back. Imagine that being off the Oregon coast and kind of smelling, you know, the Siletz River and getting closer and feeling those currents and then just going up. You know, I think that'd be wild. Hmm. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, given the fact that the third most recent Danish monarch was Christian Carl Frederick Albert Alexander Wilhelm, what are your thoughts on death? Um, well, is he still alive? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, then I, I'm sorry for <laughs> his passing. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, are, are we afraid of death? I'm not afraid of death. I th like every person I think about it and some maybe artists think about it more than others. It's a motivating force, right? We joke, or maybe we, we, um, speculate that certain writers uh, were obsessed by it. Emily Dickinson was obsessed by death, you know. Mm. Well, you know, only in maybe a third of her poems, you know. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, well, you know, it sells and it's interesting and it's creepy and gothic and fascinating. So I'm fascinated by death, um, but I, uh, I like life. And so I don't, you know, I try to avoid death, but I don't, you know, I, I want to live. I take some risks and, you know... Um, I just, I try to live in a way that makes you mindful of death, but never 
afraid or shaped by a worry of death. Hmm. And you gotta, you gotta live. You have to. I'm sure Wilhelm lived a good life. Are paradoxes simply curiosities, useless contradictions, or do they hold a deeper truth? They definitely hold a deeper truth. Don't you think? I, I don't think. I just write. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's incorrect. Uh, that's a paradox. <laughs> and incorrect. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's people, there are a lot of opposites out there. I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. People are complex. For example, people are full of, we sometimes, if we're angry or want to be critical, we say, well, that someone's a hypocrite. Mm. They say one thing, they do another. And in certain situations, that can be very frustrating, okay? But on the other hand, you know, someone could be a health freak but loves to, you know, you know smoke pot every weekend or, or drive race cars, you know, and, uh, you know. So I, I like the complexity. I like the way things that maybe are, contradictions but kind of i use the word complementarity you know they complement each other hmm. two opposites can kind of help us understand the whole i mean i think it's true in lots of places physics right is light a particle or a wave i mean i don't know maybe it's both right huh what's something you should never say to a fisherman oh wow um you know they're pretty durable sort um oh you should never say oh why are you hurting the fish <laughs> go home that's probably probably shouldn't say that they might well you can say it but i don't think they'll appreciate it hmm. but you can say good luck or you know anything biting that's okay how's it going catch hmm. anything any luck today that's when we always say any luck today any action i see but, but uh, so if you approached a fisherman what would you what would you say afternoon <laughs> so triangle lake you're from that area indeed so are there a lot of anglers on triangle lake uh a few yeah okay yeah and you just say kind of hello and do you ever ask them what they're catching mm, not particularly i don't know much about fish myself okay yeah but it's a, a general sort of commonly acknowledged truth that if you live in the country you like you wave at strangers yeah yeah i like that yeah i always wave at strangers yeah. i i smile at people on campus you know i I like a little eye contact. Nothing weird. <laughs> I respect people's privacy. But when I walk down the sidewalk, I, I lift my head and look up and just a little nod, like acknowledge my fellow human being. Yeah. But I, I notice a lot of people don't, you know. We live in isolated times. Well, we do. And there's and there's kind of fear, too. People are afraid of others. And I understand there's abuses and, and uh, attacks that occur and people have maybe a reason to be cautious but I think, you know, one of the, the solutions is, a, is also to express some warmth and recognition that we, that the other creature, you know, is, is here, right here across the table from you or across the, the pavement. So, yeah. yeah, I try to say hi. And finally, is it possible to unbelieve something once you have believed it? And if so, do you find this show unbelievable? I find this show very believable. I find your questions unusual and um, delightfully refreshing and surprising. They, they have all the kind of impetuosity and extemporaneous qualities of the imagination and, and joy and felicity and fun. So, but to come back to your very important question, you know, I think it's one of the hardest things to do, but maybe one of the most important things to try to do if you really have a different point of view if you could grow up believing something it could be a religion could be a, a politic it could be you know some attitude some philosophy if you're really change your mind if you get new data and new ideas and you say you know i can't believe that anymore you really should change but we are so linked we are so bound to the past you know mm. um the corpse of memory, Emerson said, right? You know, the consistency of our own patterns, that it's very hard for people to unbelieve what they once believed. But, you know, I, I like to think it's possible. Hmm. And now, poetry by Dr. Henry Hughes. This poem is called Our Drinking. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an exploration of one of the things... Uh, some people struggle with, um, I've struggled with, and uh, and trying to find maybe a lyric 
um, root through it. Exiled Temptations, A Cool Glass of Outer Space, A Movie Mobbed with Friends, One More Peach from the Waxy Box of Overripe. We trip on eggshells and swab our knees with gin, caps spinning until our talked-off heads sag like diapers. Noon cleanups, the missing acres of last night, lights on, gate left open, dog run off. Memories slash and wince, thick woods and a stalled jeep. Asleep on the back seat, a sweet child we never had. And this next poem is called Bats in the Classroom. This comes out of an experience I had in Fall City High School. I was uh, visiting there. I like to do high school visits and talk about writing. And uh, kids tell great stories. And great things happen in the classroom. And this is a true story where a bat like flew into the class. And, uh, you know, someone, of course, got the tennis racket out, you know, and, uh, and killed it. Um, and I didn't agree with that, but it happened. <laughs> and then the kids told their stories. And I kind of adapted it from that. Bats in the classroom. A small sooty bat beats frantically around the fluorescent 10th grade classroom. Of course, someone gets a tennis racket and it's all over. A chirpy student in the front tells the class about the cedar bat house outside his window. The vent-like entrance and cozy chambers. How bats flutter off at dusk and crawl in each morning. One kid hears his mother's bills push through the tin mail slot. Another smells bread burning in the toaster. Another sees her leathery father climbing through their trailer window into his velvet coffin for the day. The quietest girl in the room thinks of all the gloves she's lost, slipping back into the warm pocket of her coat. And that poor little mouse-eared bat who couldn't find his way home. Thank you. We'll return to the horrors of the world whirling in words of woe and wandering wanton for want of water after the break. You're listening to KWOU. The world ends two days from now. How does that make you feel? I'm sure you don't feel at all attached to this world I have refused to give you. Its destruction is mine alone, and you are forced to stand by as I rip it apart with both hands. Well, with one hand. I've always let one hand do the dirty work while the other remains innocent. That way I'm never completely a guilty man. Guilty. Now there's a feeling. A complex feeling, too. A feeling of a complex, a network of taffy stretched long and wiry round the chasm within your brain to catch bats as they fly through, much like the caverns which Rose Hatter and her father now traverse, but I'm not interested in them. You know they must fail. So why would it be at all interesting? You are, like me, in my childhood absolutism, saying that things' inevitable end automatically disqualified them from the running. The running away from said end. How could it be interesting when it all falls to ruin? When it's sent off into the void like radio waves into the atmosphere? Of course, you make the same mistake as I did. You conflate meaning with interest, and rightly so. For when we say colloquially that something is meaningless, we usually mean it is not worth our interest and therefore not interesting. But who is to decide what is worth interest? Besides, we all know you're borrowing yourself into oblivion. You can't even pay the interest back, let alone the debt itself. Ah, debt. Now there's a feeling. It's feelings like those that make me doubt my decision, if you can call it that. I do. I scroll through the latest magic cards and weep at what they foretell of my future. If you wish for blessings, mortal, ask your demon masters. We've given enough to your kind. As I've said before, I'm right back where I started, afraid that I've got it wrong, and thus I'm afraid of death. There was a time, admittedly, where I didn't feel like that, that I was doing the things just like you wanted me to. And they were right. It did feel like death, like 
Six feet of dirt was holding me down on this whirling centrifuge world. I still enjoy the numinous at arm's length. We joke and we poke because we're utterly afraid of when it wakes up. When, because we are paranoid in our certainty. The sublime is rare. The serene comes and goes. The surreal strikes like a tiger. The normal is hard enough to be in. The normal and the numinous caught up in this dance, not sure who's leading. If there's been no change and I'm back where I started, then why bother? Like I said, maybe people don't change. Maybe we're like a droning note that we, in our thrashing thirst for musicality, wail desperately a melody over and under it, not realizing that the drone already contains within it fundamental frequencies we were too hasty to listen for. Can you hear it? The second, the fourth, the fifth? Meaning is matroshka, not energia. And so is story. Rose thinks to herself as she peels back yet another layer of the earth. The incels and ancestrals were right. The earth is hollow, like a promise built on nothing, the absence of turtles all the way down. It is both repetitive and progressive, treading bold new ground every time it returns to its starting place. She was dizzy. She had not seen the sun. The only source of light was from the honey-thick lamp wheezing out its dusty rays at the foot of the king, the regent, wielder of hooks and giver of golden armor, the loathsome toad of Nexeneth, King Plot. My regency, your bloated form looks especially sickly today. Her father prostrated himself before the imperative one. The plot croaked in a vocal fry, steady and acidic, like a sticky, clogged-up soda fountain with choices of Coke, Diet Coke, or Dr. Sierra Dew's great bubblegum banana infusion triple matcha tea fizz light. I think I'll get a little bit of each. The plot informed Rose through this exposition that she had been brought here to save Nexeneth from the coming prophecy. Seeing as she was a main character, albeit meta, The plot surmised that the story would not end abruptly if Rose did not resolve the conflict bestowed upon her by said plot. All she had to do was stay with the king here and deny herself catharsis, preventing the city from blowing up prematurely and, in theory, carrying it on past the blinking out of other kingdoms who had not been so clever. Whoever said English was a useless major. Rose did not like being objectified in her subjectivity and obligatorily refused, as per the plot's instruction. "'Give her time!' her father screamed in ecstasy. "'She'll come around to it eventually. It's her destiny!' The plot slid its forked tongue on its middle lip and sighed. As always, things were going according to plan." Luce and Fuchsia had already found the apartment to which the soundbite alluded. As it turns out, taking your mind off the task at hand and thinking about something else for a while really does work, even when you're on a world-ending time crunch. It's almost as if cultivating a sense of drama isn't the most productive way to solve a problem. Did you ever think about that? In fact, they're already back at the inn, which, coincidentally, is the careening cockatrice, the less successful counterpart to the flying fox run by Jaggard's brother Yerksnick. They discussed their defictory and Vic feat. Pretty sad that the guy would take less than minimum wage to work for those rapscallious reptiles. Eh, artists gotta do what artists gotta do. Someone asks you for a crunchy ambient field recording, you put on your boots and do your duty. Still, I was really hoping the lizards weren't lying, that there would be some sort of revelation, however esoteric, that would somehow make sense of it all. Explosions, the prophecy, the author, everything. That's a bit of a tall order, isn't it? I suppose you're right. It was fun just to go hunting for it, though. Yeah, that's what the hunt was always ever for anyhow. We have what we need. Thank the Numinous we were able to resolve our our arcs before the coming flood. Oh, I wouldn't thank the Numinous. Something tells me we haven't seen the last of it. What makes you say that? A small yellow lizard standing three feet behind me. 
Don't you dare. Hello again. Whoa, whoa, comment with the fangs. Watch it. Don't make me call the Komodos. I'm just here to talk. I am here to kill you. Yeah, she is so here to kill you. I've come to tell you that what you thought was Vic Feet was in fact just one layer of the puzzle, one piece of the onion. You have completed stage one and now must go backstage to find where all the actors are hiding and bring them to light. Make haste. You have not but two days before your wandering is squandered. Your clue is thus. With a precision tool, level each end slate section by driving wooden slate wedges provided between the tops of the base frame and bottom of the slate as shown. Keep the wedges as close to the countersink holes as possible. And with that, the little yellow lizard disappeared. This pissed the hell out of Luce and Fuchsia. Meanwhile, Augustine was dead. I don't know what that's like. Slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and all that. You're not allowed to just forget about her now that she can no longer act within the story. You don't treat people that way, do you? You monster. Anyway, she's dead. And I killed her. I killed her, and it doesn't matter. Likewise, I stand outside the careening cockatrice, and it doesn't matter. To complete the set, I glance down and greet the turtle and desert tortoise, who don't matter. Afternoon, Matt. Get lost, turtles. Go back to your conspiratorial community in the dirt. Oh, we're already lost, thank you very much. We were actually hoping you could point us in the direction of the nearest burger joint. I'm not going to tell you that it's a block down from here on the right, but even if I did, the place sucks because they don't have sliders. Did you go yesterday? Yeah, why? They get their shipments on Wednesday. They were probably out. How do you know these things if you haven't been there? The reptilian conspiratorial community controls a large portion of the meat industry. Is that so? Yep. Anyway, thanks for the tip. We've had a hard day of manufacturing mystery and intrigue, and we're going to take a well-deserved afternoon off. Say, want to come? We'll split some sliders with you. Matt was not conscious for three whole seconds. Then he sharply inhaled and agreed before he knew what he was doing. And they did order sliders at Marsha's Old Style Bar and Chill, which was remarkably underpriced for the portions of food that it served, which called into question either A, the quality of the ingredients, B, Marsha's ability as a business person, or C, the assumption that this was indeed reality and not some drug-induced fever dream that Matt would soon wake from. Fortunately, it was the third one. Matt had been down here for weeks now, and the reptiles had taken to giving him hallucinogens to calm his nihilistic rage. And I mean, don't we all? The turtle who doesn't matter calmly discussed the recent developments in their plan with the tiny yellow lizard. You really think that's going to work? The tiny yellow lizard looked grimly into the middle space between the cavern wall and his nostrils. It has to. It's our only hope. And Matt Brown jerked fitfully. It was too linear, too cliché, too implicative of some sort of tension and resolution to be true. But they had him bound. For the reptiles knew much. Even the secret weakness underneath the quote-unquote secret weakness of vampires. Matt Brown was afraid. My brine pool sits heavy in a seafloor depression. If this is water, then I can't help but be salty. You thought you dove deep down. You thought you could leave town. Much to your chagrin, I'm here smiling. Excuse me if you can't read my recursive. I'm cursed to blurt out words you hear out loud. It's hot out now, so I blot out the sun, because these words are wards, and the war's just begun. Or at least it hasn't reached the seabed where sirens screech I see red, my spirit myriad in its deliriousness, eerie how the head lies to ya. Here he comes, hear his guns dungeoneering down the depths that I thought were mine. But nothing's mine, not even these words. Say I'm young, but young said that first comes culture from whom I vultured off the bones of a day well spent like Joseph is what I need. The bro stuff threw me into these weeds. And I'm trying to get out. 
or at least say that while doing nothing, druid puffing on his sacred pipe of stagnation, but this country's not dear to me. It's clear to me the answers won't come from antlers rammed haphazardly into the Lazarus tree. Rather, for me, who's already got some head trauma, trades the period for the comma. Here he is, the karma calling drama king who couldn't spare a drachma for the body on the road, because I got me a heavy load. At least they believe in something, you know? I'm the worst of both worlds. A greasy cosmic sausage spanning the length of space like a drawbridge. Split me and watch my juices dribble. My excuses quibble this way and that. I fall flat on my buns, toasted from the overused light of the sun. And I drip all the way down through the ground into the profoundly deep ocean where no sin can reach me. Emotion can't breach me. And lo and behold, the lake sits screeching into my ear, you fool. I'm still here. Tune in next week for the next episode. Remember to use code ARTISDEAD at checkout to receive a 1% discount from this show's sponsor, who repeatedly refuses to tell me who they are, so I'm not entirely certain what product or service I'm promoting. Ah, I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm Jasper Beck, and this is The Amazing Unbelievable Adventures of Dr. Theophilius Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion, Archibald the Tasmanian Emu. You're listening to KWOU.